I'd like to talk to you about pocket monsters. Yeah, that's what the US marketers thought. That's why they called it Pokemon. Okay, if I have to explain what Pokemon is at this point, there's no hope. I'm a pessimist, so here's the skinny. Episode 1 aired in Japan on April 1st, 1997. Suck it, Digimon. Popular enough to challenge Mario for the Nintendo crown, was banned in many US schools for the use of the term evolution, and at the time of this video has 895 episodes, 18 feature films, and the first of those films is the all but constant whipping boy of the internet, Mewtwo Strikes Back, or as the NC and everyone else on the internet calls it, Pokemon the first movie. This film, according to Box Office Mojo, is the highest grossing anime film ever shown in US theaters, even beating Spears Away and Ponyo. So why does it get such a bad rap? Well, I was there the day it was released, and so was my highly embarrassed to be dragged off to an older brother. And I do not remember it sucking. So let's see who's right by taking a look at it. We begin with Mewtwo's childhood. Yes, I know, this is technically a different film, but as this was added to the film's opening and partially used in the US edit of it, I'm counting it as one movie. Basically what happens is that Mewtwo, Charmander 2, Bulbasaur 2, Squirtle 2, and a girl named Amber 2 are all in a type of psychic matrix as they share their thoughts with one another. They were created by a doctor via cloning who was obsessed with bringing his dead daughter back to life by making a clone substitute. So basically Astro Boy, but with clones. Remember, if you're a scientist and your kids die, just recreate them. Through science! <laughs> it's the anime way. He even looks like Dr. Tenma. So Amber 2 teaches Mewtwo about the world and the five of them become friends. However, she and the other three Pokemon clones begin to deteriorate and die, leaving Mewtwo alone and confused by Amber's last words. Life is wonderful. Grief enrages him, causing his powers to flux. The fearful scientists inject him with a serum to make him forget about Amber and his rage. But, as the years pass, Mewtwo's frustration of not being able to remember why he is angry builds and festers, quelled only by his confusion as to why life is wonderful. Until one day when he hears a psychic echo from the original Mew and wakes up for the first time. Welcome to the real world. Mewtwo asks the scientists what they want to do with him, but all they want to do is science is ask the kingdom come. Mewtwo takes it well. With his anger now unleashed in the same manner as my ex, he meets the closest thing to a villain the show had at the time. Giovanni, head of Team Rocket and Donald Trump's anime counterpart. He silver tongues Mewtwo into being his partner in quotation marks, getting him to battle and steal Pokemon for his empire. But when Mewtwo learns he only considers him a slave to be used as he sees fit. This is developing into a very bad habit. Betrayed and angrier than ever, Mewtwo declares that all humans are unfit in his eyes and the reign of Mewtwo will soon begin. Cut to the main characters of the show, Ash, Misty, and only around so that it seems like Ash and Misty aren't having shenanigans in the woods. Pikachu. Ash gets an invite to face the greatest Pokemon master in the world, from one of the rarest Gen 1 Pokemon, and they don't react to it despite it being an epic deal in the show. Ash accepts, but the ferry to the master's island is shut down due to an approaching typhoon. Other trainers use their water Pokemon to swim there, but the trio's Pokemon aren't strong enough to cross. Good thing there are Vikings to take them across. Okay, Ash. Even people who don't know this show can tell this is a trap. You know, Team Rocket? Those three losers who keep trying to steal your Pokemon all the time? They pull stuff like this constantly. These three even look like them. So what are you gonna do? Oh, God damn it! So yes, it's a trap, but God himself tries to kill Ash for his continued stupidity, and they're all washed into the sea. However, they use their water Pokemon they said were too weak to reach the island to reach the island. They are greeted by a brainwashed Nurse Joy, a main supporting character of the show, disguised as a... nun? Lady-in-waiting? I don't know. She leads them into the not-at-all-ominous waiting room of waiting, where the badass trainers, who didn't fall for Viking tricks, are waiting for the Pokemon Master to show himself. Let's go out and the Master descends from on high like the White Ranger. Of course it's Mewtwo! Who else would it be? Meanwhile, outside... Behold that which has been and shall be again. Arceus, my bespeckled rear end. Look at him, the most powerful Pokemon of all. Fear him, fear him! So anyway, Mewtwo says that he is the master of all Pokemon. Until Nintendo adds a new set, that is. And he was using Nurse Joy as a psychic puppet because her knowledge of Pokemon was useful to him. 
Yeah, that's the reason. Tu goes on to say that he is the new ruler of the world, master of humans and Pokemon. In the basement, Team Rocket has been sneaking around and find Mewtwo's lab. One of them accidentally activates the machines and Meowth gets cloned, revealing that his plan is to replace all life on Earth with clones. Apparently Mewtwo is a big fan of the sixth day. He says that humans just want to make slaves out of Pokemon, to which one trainer says, If you are a Pokemon, there's no reason I can't capture you! Did you seriously just prove his point? Ash challenges Mewtwo to a battle, who summons his own super enhanced clone Pokemon to battle for him. Wow! Hypocrite much? As these trainers have the same Pokemon, they engage in a mirror match and get their collective non-clone asses handed to them. Mewtwo takes their Pokemon and clones them into the ARMY OF THE DAMNED! Nah, I'm just kidding. Make zombie Pokemon video. Takes from their inferior enslaved Pokemon, superior Pokemon to do his bidding. Freedom! Ash decides to take on Mewtwo himself by running up to him and punching him. God damn it, Ash! Psychic Pokemon are strong against fighting type moves. Plus, he's telekinetic. Don't you think he's just gonna. Only God can save him now. And he did. Praise Mew! Praise him! Blasphemy! So Mew 1 shows up, who I just noticed looks more like a kangaroo mouse than a cat. It is his will. Mew says that what the clones are doing is wrong, that Pokemon and humans can be friends, and that just because Mewtwo has a mega evolution and he doesn't, doesn't mean that he's inferior to him. Uh, okay, I, I, I added that last bit. Mewtwo blocking the Pokemon's powers, the battle of the original versus the remake begins. At this point when reviewing the movie, most people like to point out the hypocrisy of how the song that plays here, which you are not hearing due to copyright claims, is about how fighting is wrong, yet Pokemon are supposed to fight each other. Good point. Except Pokemon are meant to fight for sport and competition. Here, they're fighting to the death. They are trying to kill each other. Anyone who knows Pokemon can tell you that you never kill another Pokemon in battle, not even in the Japanese versions. That is what the characters are reacting to. The idea that their Pokemon friends are being forced to kill or be killed. It's more anti-war than anti-fighting. It was better handled in the Japanese version, but this is Norman J. Grossfeld and Michael Hagney, the adaptation producer and director, trying to westernize and recreate the film in an American style, which always seems to make things more annoying than they should be. Speaking of annoying, Ash runs in trying to get Mew and Mewtwo to stop fighting and... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but even as a, even as a kid, that made me laugh my ass off. Ash dies, and I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm gonna get railed. Everyone is, of course, sad, so much so that the Pokemon call Mulligan with her tears and bring him back to life, well, back from stone. This shows Mewtwo the error of his ways. A human sacrificed himself to save the Pokemon. Actually, he just leapt into the line of fire yelling, STOP! STOP! He is so touched that Mewtwo cancels his plans to destroy all life takes his clones and goes with Mew to learn the meaning of friendship. Wait. Pink, cute, energetic character with blue eyes that is whimsically wise. Purple, super smart cynic that wants to learn about friendship. 
and had a letter-delivering dragon earlier in the film. HOLY FREAKING PARTIES! Uh, yeah, so... The clones and Mew rise into the clouds with our heroes feeling closer to their Pokémon than ever before. Too bad they didn't save their game. Yep, Mewtwo erases their memories of all that happened and teleports them to the mainland with no clue how they got there or remembering the lesson that they learned about Pokémon-human relations. Uh. And they all lived happily ever after, although Ash has an inexplicable fear of statues from that day forward. How does this film hold up after 17 years? The same. Not very well. Its message is poorly conveyed, the plot is thin, and despite the U.S. producers trying to make things clearer, Mewtwo's motivations feel unwarranted, a big flaw considering he's supposed to be the focus of the movie. In the U.S. cut, Mewtwo's backstory is removed and almost all his dialogue is replaced, making him feel confusing and out of place somehow. It isn't much better in the original, but at least you get a clearer motivation behind his anger. Ironic, since Japanese storytelling usually leaves more things unexplained than in the U.S. And this was a reworked film. The story is watered down, and after seeing the Japanese version, the US one does seem like the diet version. Mewtwo's plan to destroy and replace all life came from his inability to deal with the rage that was left when Amber died in front of him, and the fact that he no longer remembers her means he has no idea where his anger comes from. So he tries to destroy anything that might be the cause of his rage. Humanity, how humans treat Pokemon, how a Pokemon simply bow down to the humans. Something deep inside of him says that there was something that he lost, but he cannot find it, making him pitiable. However, you take that out and suddenly Mewtwo comes off as a genocidal dictator claiming liberation under his superior guidance, without any real strong reason for him to be that way, except for being betrayed by Giovanni, which is such a huge leap from A, betrayal, to B, destroy all life, that it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Norman J. Grossfeld and Michael Hegney said in their commentary of the film that they wanted to write in their own concepts and ideas into the film, and in their commentary of the third film, they said they always try and rework things to make it feel like a, quote, more homegrown western story. They even had the original animation team reanimate nearly 20%, according to them, of the film, a la George Lucas, to add new storm clouds and psychic auras to show that telekinetic powers are being used, because they thought it was unclear who was moving things. Gee, could it be the ultra-powerful psychic doing it? Better make that clearer so that the kids don't get confused. This makes things feel more childish, plastic, and gives off a muddled, Americanized aura that sub-fans hate and is very hard to ignore here a consistent problem with Pokemon material from this era in the franchise. The message that fighting is wrong is poorly transferred. As it stands, most people get confused as Pokemon is all about battles, yet they fight here and somehow it's wrong, making viewers scratch their heads. Like I said, they're fighting to kill and not for competition, which is the real message. Violence solves nothing. Mewtwo is lashing out in anger and wanting revenge for how humans treat Pokemon. But what happens? Mew and Mewtwo are in a stalemate, and the Pokemon are beating each other to the point where they can't continue, and are lying in pain and possibly dying from their injuries. It'll only end in mutual destruction. The human characters just stand there, preaching about how fighting this way is wrong, while making little distinction between this kind of fighting and normal battles. This leads to the conclusion that they're being hypocritical. Had they made a better distinction or tried to stop them without just leaping into their death, that may not have happened. Ultimately, it's just a poor dub of an okay film, but in terms of Pokemon, this is a must-see and was an excellent experience. Not only did us first-gen Pokemon fans get to see Mew 2 as well as Mew, the only Pokemon you could not get in the game without a special and very rare mod from Nintendo, but we got to see them on the big screen. We all thought, we get to see our favorite game in the theaters like the big kids see their movies? We looked up from our green and black Game Boys and tiny CRTVs and were blown away by surround sound and a 50-foot screen. They even gave away special Pokemon cards with a mission. It was like Poke Christmas, a time when Pokemon fans could go to the theater and see our obsession in the same screen room that we saw Toy Story and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's a feeling that's very hard to describe even now. That feeling is why I've not let go of my Pokemania to this day. I even have the first three films on both American and Japanese DVD. We'll talk about the other two films I saw in theaters, eventually. But for now, thank you all for watching me for my first year of YouTube. Yes, this, this video marks my one year anniversary. And it has meant more to me than anything else. And even if it disappears tomorrow, I'll still remember what joy I was able to bring you for the rest of my life. I'm a freak. An anime freak. See you next time.
Yeah. <sniffs> 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 <sniffs>